Hello, welcome to the world of Word. Coming up, another word in your attic. And if you enjoy this, visit our Patreon to find out more about our exclusives and our general work of national importance. The link is in the notes below. And now, on with the show. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view. We're delighted to be joined by old chum and colleague, Mark Cooper. Mark, how are you doing? Terrific to see you. Fantastic. Top of the Where morning, you, gentlemen. Top of the morning to you. <laughs> now, now, shouldn't you... Uh, where should you be if this was a normal year, around about today? Uh, well, right now, I'd be in the office, limbering up for a Glastonbury that's only, what, eight days away, something like that? A big hole in all our lives. But instead, I've been sort of sifting through the archives of the BBC, well, with a lot of help, mostly from, in fact, most of it's been done by other people, but looking at an incredible archive, because we've been going, what, 24 years now? So the BBC are mounting a big Glastonbury archive weekend with full sets from the likes of everybody from Beyonce to Arthur Lee and Love. I'm very excited about playing all of Forever Changes to Coldplay to... Jay Z, etc., and then we're doing three live programs every evening, where we're hoping that people will congregate as if they were at Glastonbury, possibly putting out tents in, in, in their gardens, gentlemen, sitting in their living rooms in a pair of mud cake wellies, exactly, with a bottle of cider, yeah. with cider next to them, and and <laughs> revelling it all. And, and then there's hundreds of sets on the iPlayer, so. You can either watch the programmes and what's on the TV or choose your own set. A bit like if you were at Glastonbury and you decided to meander away from stage the to stage. Yeah. yeah, and you know, whether towards West Holt or to the other stage or up to the park, you could, you'd choose your musical pleasure and I'll probably bump into a few things on the way that you didn't expect to see. Right, right. So is this, are you supposed to be retiring round about now? Well, retiring, I'm not sure about that word, but... Oh, okay, all right, sorry. What's Stepping back. Transitioning, I think, oh, is a country word. <laughs> it should be transitioning. Very I'm fashionable. Cer I'm certainly, I am leaving the BBC after 30 years. I, I expect a gold watch and chain at any moment. You You'll know, be lucky. So, yes, I will be lucky. But that's what you did get. When, and, I mean, does anybody retire anymore? But that, that's... That's I a very good point. BBC. I am leaving the BBC and... Um, so it's great to be doing this Glastonbury thing. And I've been doing, finishing some last projects and documentaries, a soul series called Soul America, and continuing the series we do on Top of the Pops year by year. So yeah, 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 that's great. We've just reached the early 90s. And I was just watching on Monday, the last 91, of course, finishes with Nirvana's visit to Elstree and Boreham Wood to play that smells like teen spirit so that those shows very much take you through a year and also tell you about some of the experiences that various pop musicians and musicians have when they encounter the commissars and producers and rules of the bbc that both of you gentlemen will remember well although you were probably probably we were all slight refusenics in as much as we tried to change the rules top of the pops as a weekly show obviously had a, had to abide by its rules so Nirvana show up at Top of the Pops and um, Top of the Pops has moved to Elstree partly so it can get younger and, and, and a bit cooler and everybody's asked to sing live at this point in time. And I don't know if you remember the performance, but... but oh, I remember this vividly. They changed the words to, well, remind us. Yeah. And Kurt sings like a Dalek, basically, yeah. in a completely different key. The band obviously are mining because Chris Novolosek, is it? I know how you say his name, is careening around with his bass and Dave Grohl is miming in the most... I always think miming is particularly hard for drummers and it certainly was hard yes, for Yes, that's so true. He, he yeah. was just enjoying himself. But meanwhile, Kurt is standing there singing like a Dalek. And of course, this went down incredibly well with the new grunge, Kurt Muskenti at the time, who thought... Didn't, didn't, didn't he change the words to load up on drugs and kill your friends or something? Was that the well, occasion? Oh, I can't believe the BBC were tolerated. <laughs> well, it was live, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know. I need to go. Basically, it's very yeah. hard to decipher what he's singing, Mark. So I'm not, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not entirely sure. But 
Rumour has it that this was, you know, one of the great two fingers gestures to the establishment and instantly made Nirvana even greater stars throughout Europe and the rest of the world because they'd stuck it to the man. But uh, our wonderful director, Verity, reveals through interviews with the likes of Tim Booth and James, who was there, and the, one of the new presenters, because this was very early in the year zero relaunch of Top of the Pops, one of the first of many relaunches, <laughs> that Kurt had lost his voice. And um, Tim offered to massage his throat, which Kurt, for whatever reason, declined. Tony offered to go down to Boreham Wood to get some Beecham's powders or lemon set, but, but Kurt decided the best course of valour was to sing in a totally different key. So um, there's, there's a little anecdote from this programme from 91. Verity will kill me because it's such a great story. And it's wonderful <laughs> to watch it and it probably won't go out for some time. But there's lots of great people in it, the KLF, for example. It's, it's a, you can feel pop re music starting to be redefined in the early 90s and more and more voices and bands coming in from the indie world, hip hop starting to sort of go a bit more mainstream. Obviously there's loads of rave dance tunes. There's some great stories with the various rave acts coming in and encountering Top of the Pops, all of whom of course hoist various dancers on them to, you know. Oh right, yes of course. Orbital, you can imagine what, how orbital. <laughs> <laughs> but also some of these groups protest against these rules. So Orbital rather wonderfully um, put the plugs of their of their keyboards on top in a, you know, in a silent gesture to those who understand dance music that they're not even plugged in. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> it's such a, funny, many... such a funny thing, isn't it, Top of the Box? Because all these people just grew up desperately wanting to be on it. And then well, when they got on it, they all had to pretend that they really didn't, didn't desperately care. want That's to be right. on it. Do you know what I mean? There, there's hardly any appearances where they go, oh, we've arrived, top of the world, which is well, how yes, they were they, feeling. They, they all say how much, the, the term they all use is validated. Whether right. it's you or Oceanic or whoever, they all say we felt validated. Mr. C from the Shaman, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> handing out, as he says, you know. I told you so to his various mates who, and, yeah, and probably his neighbours who all said he'd never amount to anything. That's what it's that's all it's about. Revenge. That's what that's it's all about. Revenge. They ought to, they ought to do I, special, I proved my point. Yeah. Special edit for school teachers, didn't they? You know, yeah. they? Those are the people it's aimed at. Everybody who ever laughed at me at school. Yeah. I Doubting parents. <laughs> Comedy is, so it does alternate in this era between the rave bands, some of whom seem incredibly excited to be there and are hyper to the point of, you know, imminent collapse, you know, whether it's Rosala or Oceanic, and you can, they're all raving away and, you know, the crowd are going mad. And then on the other hand, there's the Norman Cook approach, which was to wear shorts and look as nonchalant as possible. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as Lindy, the singer from um, That'd Be Good To Me, explains in one of the films. So. Right. <laughs> Extraordinary. So we asked you to get out a few... Um... A few souvenirs, a few bits of clutter, and share them with us. Have you managed to find anything? Yes, I, I, I found a few things. I did go up into the attic last night where Good. my son now lives and, and has been complaining bitterly about all my junk up there. And I sorted through various boxes. So is your son saying you've got too many records here, Dad? Can you get them out of the place? Too many records, too much everything. There's endless complaints about how I've reduced their house to, you know, <laughs> standards that are unacceptable as they haven't taken the obvious step of turning on their heel and leaving or anything like that no, i think it's far more likely they'll eject me and my wife <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> the, 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 you know the lunatics have taken over the asylum <laughs> right. so here then if you can see this all right les cousins oh, oh they, the folk les club. cousins fantastic is, is so that is, is that a beer mat uh no this is this is what you needed. This is your pass. When you joined Cousins, because it was a coffee house and club, you, you had to join. There had to be a membership. Oh, yes, didn't, yes, yes. didn't yes. serve any alcohol. And it was at 50 Greek Street. And to me, this, this, this room, this cellar in Greek Street was the passport to another world, you know. And I probably started going there when I was 16 or 17. I was going to say, how old were you? You must have been incredibly young, 16. That's fantastic. 16 or 17. I, well, I think at 16, I went to my first concert, which was Esther and Abby O'Farim at the Royal Albert Hall, <laughs> yeah. mum and sister. 
um, I had an early love of Israeli folk music. Really? Just yeah. very excited to go. Quite how my sister, who was five years younger than I, managed to get to go. <laughs> and probably I was most inspired by Cinderella Rockefeller or whatever of the course. Eurovision number one was. Although I do remember them singing a very beautiful, she sang a very beautiful version of the Bee Gees' Morning of My Life. Anyway, soon after this, I started going to Greek Street with a couple of school friends. And this and would have been the time of, was it been Roy Harper playing Bert Yanch? Well, on the, on the back in a proper schoolboy list is a list. Of oh, you've the written oh. on the back. David Graham. Oh. Back. Isn't that sweet? I don't know if you can see any of that and the like, but shall I read some? Yeah, oh, yeah read, read some. Out. I see yeah. David Graham, yeah. How, what's lovely about this is they're all equally important. Obviously, they weren't all equally important, but anybody I saw, Al Stewart, John James, Roy Harper, Keith Christmas, Ralph Mattel, Al Keith. Jones, Mike Cooper, Third Ear Band, Mike Chapman, Nigel uh, Barker, Davy Graham, Michael Clare, John Martin, Chris Davis, Sandy Denny, Andy Fernback, Clive Palmer, Wiz Jones, Robin Scott, Mark Brilli. I could go on, couldn't I? So you saw That's all incredible. of those people? Well, and, and, all of these people because they had these fantastic, here's the membership inside. Oh, wow. And I would go all the time. So they had Friday and Saturday evenings, and then they had all nighters. And the all-nighters would start about 11 and you would descend down there. And obviously most of the people there were older. And, and in my estimation, obviously the artists and most of the audience were immensely, you know, I felt like an acolyte. And I was usually, and certainly initially, pretty nervous going in there just because everybody was a bit older. But um, it was great. And you could literally sit at the feet of the performers. You know, yes. you could get in there early and that they had pews and... So, John Martin always played in his pencils with his socks off, you know, when hit it, thwacking away at the guitar with that thumb technique. Yeah. And I was full of folk musicians sitting at the front, desperately studying the chord sequences that were people playing. And yeah, definitely lots of that. But but I suppose what was beautiful about Cousins was it it was it was an alter it wasn't it was an alternative folk scene. So most of the people were writing their own music. Yes, you had people like the young tradition and you still had the element of people reviving the tradition and you know, part of the revival. But it was very much it was this other side of the psychedelic coin. So all these people were writing their first songs. I mean, this was the time when John was just releasing London Conversation and then the Tumblr and Ralph Mattel first album eight frames the second and i would go enough that you would see the repertoires slowly evolve yeah 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 i mean yeah. there seemed a period when john martin would just play fairy tale lullaby and he had a tune called, everybody had to have an instrumental standout so he, he would play yes. seven black roses and seven black roses big forte which i think was in an open tuning he'd take a capo and he would slide it up and down so he'd change the key it was in very dramatically and there'd be lots of John sort of hammering on and everybody had a very dramatic guitar and instrumental. I guess this was the world post Angie, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it everybody, was. It was. everybody had an Angie, didn't they? That's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. And at school, I came upon a psychiatrist with two very good friends of mine. So uh, my friend Ted learned guitar at school and learned to play Angie. And then I had a very good friend who lived nearby called Susie and they, fell in love as young teenagers and here is them on the beach can you see oh, that oh he's oh, playing the so guitar of the time. oh good grief and they were very much in love at this point in time and this must have been around this time 68 69 this is in cornwall of course yeah of course where uh, copying the folk is they susie used to go there on holiday with her family but of course all those famous folk clubs were starting out down in cornwall like michael chapman and the famous jug band and everything he used to play and I, one of my first hitching adventures was going down to Cornwall to try and visit one of these folk clubs. I think, I, I think a grown-up took pity on me and took, took me back to their house while I was standing, probably rather frightened by an A-road, you know, at um, 8 o'clock in the evening as the shadows <laughs> lengthen, feeling a bit nervous. But it, no, it was a wonderful education in music. Very free-spirited free club. The musicians were just... John Martin was evolving very quickly into the Echoplex and experimenting. Lowell Coxhill, who played in Kevin Ayers' band, would come in and play Crazy Sax. The earlier band, who were, well, I don't know what they were, um, would come in. So there was, it, it, it was very open-minded and, and taught me so much about things like the country blues. Although I'm not sure I knew that, what I was talking about something this the other day. So I'd see Mike Cooper, who had a big sort of oh, you know, yes. attach. 
And of course, he had a national steel. Yes, he did. And, and he would play Send Me to Electric Chair, which yes. Bessie Smith, I, I now know, he used to do. And, and I, I found this, in, I realised, impossibly romantic. I'm not even sure that I knew. I mean, I must have done that it was blues or black music. I just thought the idea of being sent to an electric chair at that age was probably <laughs> the best thing that almost happened to you. Because you don't necessarily think through the consequences that you'd be dead. You just think, that would be real in my life. Coming up to cousins from suburban Bromley and driving off school to cousins felt impossibly unreal, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so fantastic. any hint of things that free-spirited souls like, like John Martin or, or, or Roy Harper or Jackson C. Frank or, or whoever, and, and, and bluesmen singing about electric chairs felt, no, I, I know. I know exactly what you mean. What you mean? What What else you got there? Well, I got just while we're in that era, I did find a program to one of those first concerts, and there's a picture of Tim Hardin, oh, really? a man I love to this very day, and well, all his songs with the sig on, of course. Yeah, he played with family oh, right. at the so Albert where, Hall. Where? At the Albert Hall. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. There's an actual program for that. Yeah, it's, it's the only one I own. <laughs> yeah, it's quite rare, actually. Yes, it, it probably is. Although there's not much to it, there's only but there's a picture of family. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. What and a, we all what remember a... Roger Chapman's wonderfully wobbly voice and how yeah. <laughs> how impressive that was because he sounded like he had been to the electric chair and back, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, he did. He did. With his wobbly voice. Yes, he did. So that was me getting going, and then um, I guess the next thing, maybe we should jump in time. So in the uh, late 70s, when punk happened, with horrible timing, just as the Sex Pistols started to play Islington Green and stuff, despairing that Britain would ever revive as a culture, and, and uh, having ended my first uh, long love affair, I took myself off to America to study. And rather disastrously for a year, went to Kent State University, which was because I knew a, of a professor who was there. But they decided to build a gym on the site of where the where the students were shot. The whole place revealed its still conservative tendencies academically as well. So then I headed off to California to Santa Barbara, and spent the next three or four years in 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 both going to, starting to write about music for Record Mirror and from San Francisco and Santa Barbara are going we down just, to LA. We were just talking about this earlier, Dave, and I, didn't you write the last review of the, uh, the Sex Pistols, the Sex Pistols Winter, Winterland last show? Didn't you review that? I did, yeah, that was the first thing I ever wrote. I had a friend, John Sheila, who I'd been to university with. He was the news editor at the Record Mirror. And I think he worked out that I was going to be in San Francisco early in, whenever it was in 78. And of course, this was the venue that I was more used to going to see the Grateful Dead and yes. uh, Johnny Winter. And I think they were the people the venue was more used to seeing. But yeah, so I went along with my friend Al and, you know, it was immediately such a fantastic drama because, and that kind of occupied really for the next two or three years because the scenes, the American scene and the British scene was so different. And there was a whole echelon of American fans who wanted to be in on the act. And of course, the Sex Pistols didn't really like anybody being in on their act, but particularly, you know, various Americans dressed up and wanting to be down, you might say. With But then alongside that fairly small early adopters was a vast number of confused, indifferent deadheads, etc. who'd gone along to check out what all the fuss was about and were confronted by a band in the paroxysms of ending who really, at this point, kind of sounded tired and, and, and Sid could so obviously, you know, not play his bass <laughs> guitar whatsoever. Which would and not yet, appeal to a Grateful Dead fan. Yes, and yet who, who was somehow at the same time thrilling and utterly new as a proposition and utterly defiant of all things American, all things American, even if they were, you know, early punk bands, that was... John's pose, really, right from Sex Pistols through early public image, wasn't it? That everyone else was rubbish, really. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and deluded. Mm. And, and, um, 
and uh, he parted the stage with that famous last comment, have you ever felt cheated, then good night. Yeah. And then after that, I, I started writing about all these bands coming to the, you know, the Whiskey and the Starwood and wherever, and the Roxy in LA. And when I was in San Francisco, where my good friend Al was, and I'd visit a lot, at the Mabia Hay Gardens, etc. And this is a poster from that period, which rather dramatizes something. So you'll see there's lots of English artists who were coming oh, through. Oh, yeah. That and it Elvis says... Costello. Elvis it says, Costello. It says, it says, we don't need the English at the top. We don't, need, don't need the English. <laughs> and that was, in a way, the beginning of, you know, Californians fighting back and starting to create their own culture because of the whole... The obvious lesson of punk was you shouldn't be beholden to anyone. And 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 all these one you know young Americans who lived in the world where all you could hear was Journey, Fleetwood Mac, or um, Supertramp on the radio, were obviously determined to forge their own culture. And yeah, in LA, yeah. that meant X, who were a wonderful band who I loved. And in San Francisco, that meant oh, I'm trying to think. Well, obviously, it meant the dead Ken the dead Kennedys and California Rubarabas and the rest. And so. I would write about, I started writing about this drama, and a lot of the drama was rather snotty English bands coming yes. through and <laughs> doing as you do, playing your however many six tastemaker shows in, in, in California and New York and hopefully Chicago, but maybe nowhere else, and um, cocking a snook at the locals. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Because the oh, locals it, didn't take to at all, surprisingly. No. Bizarrely, they didn't, al didn't always appeal. But on the other hand, there was a wonderful drama to this because i think a lot of bands at that time thrived on conflict you, ne you needed an adversary and i think intrinsically being in california made them adversarial absolutely it, it, it was, it was, all the bands were sad and, and i felt in british enough and english enough that i can see but i suppose outside it enough that i could see the drama of the the two sides of the coin of these encounters you know and I, again, sort of a bit like Cousins, saw everybody from, you know, Elvis Costello and The Jam and The Undertones, all their first gigs in California. So it was, again, a privilege. And then I broadened out and started interviewing people. So the very first interview I ever did was with Tom Petty. And I hitchhiked down from Santa Barbara to L.A., which was a terrible, terrible, terrible mistake. I was picked up by about eight different people six of whom were psychos, one of whom I was convinced had probably escaped from whatever was left of Charles Manson's coterie, and somehow <laughs> managed to make it to Shelter Records. I still don't know how, and interviewed, and Tom had just released that first record, as you remember, that did so well in, in the UK with American Girl and all the rest of it. Um, so that's how I started becoming what I think we all should call a, a hack. Who was yes. that for? Was that for Record Mirror? Or was that, for... that was all for Record Mirror. Yeah, it was. That's right, yeah. And then I moved back and wrote for Record Mirror. And then after being back a couple of years, two or three years, pop music started to change, didn't it? And you guys were editing smash hits. Yeah. And, 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 and I was approached by Record Mirror, which was not that happy a ship by this point in time. It had gone smaller size and... I guess a lot of us have oh, been right, there yes. too long, and we invented a new magazine. Oh, was, number one! That was yes. designed, number one! Designed wow. to take on Smash Hit. I know, it's, it's still, the hackles still rise <laughs> for me. I knew they were. I knew they were. It's a kind of immediate <laughs> thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm hoping the hackles are rising. <laughs> yeah. yours, yours truly, who managed to be both writing for this magazine, and probably in my 30s at this point, on the other hand, was I, you know, I like to think of myself as a champion of, of all things indie and reggae and kind of fringe music. And I'm particularly proud of this cover because I managed to get Mac from the Bunnymen and Morrissey together in Liverpool. Oh, really? And for this unique photo shoot celebrating the cultures of Liverpool and Manchester. And uh, we went to that grand hotel at the heart of Liverpool, whose name escapes me, full of faded grandeur. Adelphi. A, pardon? The Adelphi. That's right. And, yeah, well, that's, that's right, where all the interviews used to take place. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I flew up with Morrissey in a fairly uh, small... No PA more hitchhiking, Mark. He's fly, flying now from London right. to Liverpool. 
I told you I was a hack by this point. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so I, uh, me and Morrissey flew up there, and Morrissey, you know, loved to talk. It was great enthusiast about pop music, and so I remember we talked a lot about, you know, he had that particular enthusiasm for the girls of the sixties, the Sandy Shores and the uh, Marion yeah. Maples and the twinkles and dusty yeah yeah and we talked about all those and you know the smiths were very much breaking through at this point this was april the 28th 1984 this is right yeah yeah and then the plane started to shudder and and there was major turbulence and i thought oh my god morrissey buddy holly even before he <laughs> get to meet ian mcculloch with me in a hotel room is um we're, we're going to go down but fortunately, we did make it through, and uh, this piece happened. And this he, the piece happened partly because I, just before this, written in 82, this book. I have a copy of it up here. Oh, I still have one. You and not many other people. <laughs> no, no, that was really good. Because that was the big moment for Liverpool. It was that they were born again, weren't they? They were all born big again. Japan, one the point. teardrop explodes, you know. Why, why, why? Heat, exactly. exactly. And of course, the wonderful Bill Drummond, who managed both these groups at the beginning and, you know, would later go on to form the KLF and would steer the Bunnymen particularly in wonderful ways. You know, um, you know, I remember going on a tour of the Highlands with them a, a bit later on, and he was constantly encouraging them to play unique gigs in the middle of England, surrounded by Camo or tour along the ley lines or, or, or something that he continued well into the KLF various principles of numerology that would decide they had to release a record of this length on that day. But I suppose what I loved about them and, and, and about Bill is they, they, they were dreamers, conceptualists you might call it, but dreamers, they were idealists, you know, and um, things were getting quite grim by the mid 80s and the fact that the, the alternative these guys posed musically and also romantically I loved at a time where pop music was starting to become a little bit cynical. Yeah, yeah. It's fantastic. You look at a cover like that nowadays, your natural first thought is, oh, it's Photoshop. I know. It's, you know what I mean? Think those things yeah, they, really did. Yeah. They, they were there. Yeah, it, looks, you know. it looks like a Zoom call, actually. It's a well, that, no, I, I know. Mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean the Morrissey number one. I mean the number one with uh, with yeah. Morrissey. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. it was. I think there are pictures in. I wonder if there are pictures inside, but definitely that cover is is Photoshop. Oh, I you see. Also, oh, don't don't don't, don't break the magic the here. <laughs> also, I I I I so there we were sitting at Smash Hits, thinking, how did they do that? They yeah. never did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but I, look, I don't want to give you the wrong impression. I did use the word hack earlier. So yeah, yeah. there's another yeah. cover of number one I'm particularly proud of. Go on. Uh, just... Oh my lord, did that sell? Beat is it shaky, Steve? It is. Beat Boy Beat George, George with shaky. Mark, Mark, I heard a trace of bigness and did that sell. And I know it's because of the words above shaky, I think. Exclusive interview. Uh, oh, because I see. Because we all remember the competition of the music press. And I spent ages courting his paranoid manager, Freya. Oh, oh God, yes. Fresh. Yeah, to get a story with Shaky. And I think we went to Germany. Sh Shaky was not the most keen raconteur. <laughs> he was not. To be fair, he, he wasn't the brightest, brightest. Uh, he was a great you know, rockabilly singer. Yeah. In the yeah. era of the 70s when he played the pubs, you know, they, they offered yeah. something unique. Yeah. This was his pop star era, you know, of Christmas hits, and uh, well, he did very so, well out of it, you know, really. alongside my cooler covers. I just wouldn't want to give you the wrong impression <laughs> that you know, more cousins and Echo and the Bunny. The yeah, idea yeah, yeah. that people used to do <laughs> battle over a Shaking Stevens interview exclusive, in which you yeah. exclusively would reveal nothing at all, no. would he? No. I mean, Shaky had nothing to say at all. No, we were stomped off really... home in a furious mood. They got Shaking Stevens. How did we not get that? <laughs> Competition is vital to all creative industries. <laughs> it is. And, and, it is. Uh, so how did you end up? You ended up as a record company press officer, didn't you? I think I, I first met you when you were. A I did. Officer. Yeah, and I, so I, 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 after writing for quite a few years for Record Mirror, and I was starting to write a bit for the Guardian and City Limits and 
So I was doing two kinds of writing, you might say, some more uh, cerebral and some more Shaking Stevens. Uh -huh. And um, yeah, so I got offered a job to go and work at Virgin. And I kind of, by this point, I think, wanted to see how the record industry worked because I felt like we were presented with all these acts. Um, and I was very romantic ab about them but I wanted to know how they were being presented to us and where they were coming from and what it was like. And so I worked for Virgin for nearly three years in the press office and I did a bit of A&R with the group, groups like Working Week, etc. I did the press on Madness, but who had a label called Zar Jazz, who'd left Stiff. And bands, other bands that I love just as much, who no one remembers, like Sideway Look. And... Um, uh, and I loved a lot of the people I met at Virgin, notably my wife, um, yeah, yeah. of course. But um, being in a record company is ultimately a bit like being on a team. Really, you have to be on the team. And you have to like whatever the company has decided yes. you yes. should like. <laughs> and you have to be down with that. And for a lot of time at Virgin, that wasn't very hard. You know, I think one of my earliest charges was to Tom Verlaine, who would come into Vernon Yard in his combat boots, etc., and who I loved, and obviously I loved Madness, both as people and musically. But they, they, they then went into a period where they would start to sign anything that moved. And I think already they were possibly fattening the company, you know, for to sell. potential to go on the stock market. Um, not that I realized this at the time, although the people around it may well have done. So then I did that, and then I, so I jumped ship, and I went and worked for uh, Polygram in the international department taking artists to america for about 15 months oh who did you take so well my my finest thing i'm most proud of is working with swing out sister all right and oh. we did a mix of their breakout hit that was designed for one of those new radio formats in america called the wave all oh, right so yes. then this although this got me in terrible trouble back at the label because the head of a and r david bates who's a and R, many brilliant records, said how I had no business interfering with the actual business of music or music making. But this 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 mix helped them. I've got I haven't got it in here, but it's one of my proudest objects is a gold disc from Swing Out System for selling half a million copies in America. All right. And I would go into the big black rock that was Polygram, where Bon Jovi and Cinderella, and I would go in with you know the comparatively fey English wares, whether it was Curiosity Killed the Cat or, <laughs> yeah, because there was something of a cultural divide. At this you, point. You, you were telling you, with people wearing berets every week. Yes, right? so the cane <laughs> gang and what have Double you. barreled names. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, you know, we were in our more cocktail jazz and uh, <laughs> yes. fey, I think, at this point. Yeah. And, uh, and then occasionally I would go and see groups. I went to see The Mission in Nashville, you know, who were lovely. <laughs> lonely boys out in the road in the middle of nowhere because the, those the, the, the british experience of changing america touring america hadn't changed that much no, 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 no. so that and it was interesting just learning about the you know a bit about the american music business and american radio and you know, american radio at that time was very much uh, run on independent promotion and independent promotion meant that in all the big cities there were guys or teams and they were guys mostly who would go into the radio station and get you uh, radio play but to get this you had to give them a bag of money yeah um famously it's all there in the hitman or any of those books and funnily enough these guys all took the money but most of them were also what they call in american record men they knew their music and their yeah. music yeah it, it had just consolidated into something that was a bit you know, what what fascinates me about that whole independent promotion story, which was a huge thing, as you say, at, at that time particularly, it was a kind of protection racket, wasn't it? That if you didn't pay them, you wouldn't be on the playlist. You know, Very much so. <laughs> and, 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 you know, Brit the British labels, when they had a sniff of a hit, you know, they paid. They, they, they'd be massive arguments about where the money came from, whether it should come from America, who where they were going to potentially going to take off or whether it would be paid and they'd all be scraping around their publishers etc but i guess the thing that was different is there was so much money around the yeah. music business in the Completely. 80s and 90s yeah and groups could just explode in america i remember when i was writing for record mirror going to do 
Who's the group with the guy with the fantastic hair? Stray Cats. No, 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 no. The, the ones who had the huge American hit with Iran. A flock of seagulls. A flock of seagulls. Yeah. Flock of seagulls. Yeah. I shouldn't yeah. do that. We've passed the point where gestures about huge quips. Right, that's right. It was um, beyond a quip. Great yeah. vertical hold haircut. Yeah, yeah. They they ran America for about a year on that one song, which is like MTV's idea of a dream. You know, these strange people. And I remember going to them to play Madison Square Gardens, and we God. went. I think we went a total of forty yards in a limo from the hotel <laughs> into the back entrance of Madison Square Gardens because there was just. When you when you when you hit, when you hit big in America, you hit big, and so I guess it was worth handing over. Yeah, 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 definitely. What a fantastic time though, because having all that money meant people just invested. They just took a chance on anybody, didn't they? Absolutely anybody. Very much so. Which, which that, just just now now because people are so conservative, you know. Yeah, and I think because of that, also I think probably the world the world that you know Echo and the Bunny Men represented and the other indie groups at the time you see a gradual sort of conflation and I've really seen it doing these top of the pop stocks since the 90s when suddenly being independent really meant and then that starts to sort of merge with the mainstream and people like you two spot this earlier than most in Simple Minds but gradually those two very separate worlds the post-punk world of the independent DIY aesthetic and what then America and American radio started to call modern rock, you know, with bands like The Cure and, you know, various 4AD groups and the Cocktail Twins, these worlds slowly start to, to merge and, you know, groups start to slowly get their heads up a bit from what is quite a long shoegazing year and start to yeah. think about having it large, which of course culminates in the 90s with Oasis. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah. and brick pop and that whole world. I feel like I'm not sure. You got any more things. items? What yeah, you got? got any more? What do you got there? Well, then I suppose quite soon after this, I uh, uh, in the early '90s, I joined the BBC in January 1990. As I said, it was 30 years ago, and you know, we start later with Jules. Started in '92. And, and you first really, went to, well, what, about 300 and f you went to every single recording? Didn't you? I went to every single oh, recording until I stood down from the show, which was in the 360 marks. Yes, and, and pretty much all the sound check days as well, because we, yeah. we, we used to do it in two days. We do it in one now, they do it in one. But um, uh, yeah, no, I lived, slept and breathed that show. And, um, you know... Uh, the great pleasure of it was harking back to something like Cousins, you know, the idea of curating, for one of a better words, talking to the magazine gentleman, you know, a variety of stories and what fun could be had in the contrast, even the clash of those different yeah, yeah. musical aesthetics being sort of jumbled together in one room. And of course, yeah. for me, a lot of the pleasure of later was, you know, obviously introducing new artists or having people on in their prime or welcoming back artists you hadn't seen for years particularly in the 90s and early 2000s where a lot of the what we what now everybody calls legends stock was not necessarily what it would later become because as we all know legends have times so even david bowie wasn't a legend for 20 oh, years God, that, 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 the classic case for People 20 forget. years he couldn't give him couldn't give his record to work well i know this again from the top of the pop stocks because we, we, we there, one of the shows features a performance by tin machine and so david looks wonderful but you remember that really from about 85 till about you know well, certainly the early, he had started to get a bit of traction in the late 90s, but you know, there were a lot of cold years, weren't they? Oh, Real yes. Those years, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, and later we'll bring in that and, and music from around the world. And, and because journalistically I'd spent a long time and then working at Rap this, I just had an interest in lots of diverse musics, you know, a lot of black music. And um, I guess the joy of later was being able to, Put all this music together in a room yeah. and that was something that particular the, the artists love i mean the artists particularly i remember there's an r&b set blue set of r&b singer called sunshine anderson being on the same show with nick cave and again you know particularly for the americans come american music and the music certainly was so racialized in america and in terms of radio and mm. demographics and she just said, I can't believe I'm in a room with Nick Cave. And so this is so beautiful. I feel I've escaped. 
and um, that sense of people coming together, uh -huh. which I think now is something that was happening in Q magazine as well, and then and now is taken for granted in the way we all consume music. But yeah. We forget how tribalized and segregated it yeah. was, and yeah. and you know starting to write about that music. So, Mark, you let me write a big piece about hip hop in 1990 for Q, where I went. I remember. To, Went over to interview Public Enemy, and um, so I always had that curiosity about music. And I suppose both working in the record companies and working journalistically, I, I sort of regarded different genres of music as something to be learned about and to understand and to explore. And I think that harks back both the cousins and the, the spirit of um, the, the early music festivals of the 70s, where you'd get that wonderful mixture of music where you'd see. Mm. Captain Beefheart and the Mike Westbrook Orchestra and the New Riders of the Purple Sage and you know may, maybe a soul singer although maybe not as much of that as you might have think you'd have seen but yeah. all mixed together and that idea of mixing music and, and plunging into different worlds that's what I love about music it takes you to a place and a way of seeing and a way of being in the world that is entirely different and that brings me to another story which a later story, this is from much later on, we managed to get Jay-Z to come on later. But I think this is probably before he headlined Glastonbury, so probably somewhere in the early, and in fact it was shown again the other night in the, you know, these news shows where Jules chats, he's chatting to Gregory Porter, and the first clip he chose... Which are really good. Yeah. That they one, really work. Uh, and Jules was chatting to Gregory, and he chose Jay-Z, and... Um, I really remember Jay-Z coming on later. It was an incredibly lineup of shows. Jay-Z, Foo Fighters, Nora Jones, Sting, and introducing Stornoway in the middle of the room. It was so long ago that Stornoway have had a pretty sterling indie career and folded since this happened, but um, the others are obviously all still going. And uh, so Jay-Z's Jay band comes to later, but not Jay-Z, obviously, for most of the day. And mostly a lot of the artists came and they would come to Sancho. But Jay-Z didn't come to quite late in the evening and he had a very tour, tall tour manager. And it got, number one, quite nerve-wracking that he was going to come. And number two, quite nerve-wracking that he was going to play what they'd said he was going to play. And eventually Jay-Z arrives and he's charming. But I, eventually I get summoned... Um, to the dressing room for Damien, this lovely chap who plugs and represented Jay-Z, said he doesn't really understand the show, can you come and explain it? <laughs> and um, by this point, I mean, I did, we did have to explain later to everybody for the first five or six, seven years, and every time we did the show it felt like a stack of cards that was going to collapse for at least seven years, and we kept expecting people to object to playing their songs in turn and being in the room with other people or playing the groove. And on occasion, very rare occasions, people did object. Jar Wobble, I remember, objecting to the groove because he felt it was beneath him as a musician, <laughs> even though he was going to be grooving with Bonnie Raitt and Jimmy Vaughan. Uh, <laughs> I know. It's, always, it's always Jar Wobble. He always <laughs> is, yes. No, yeah. So, um... So I go into JD's dressing room and, and I, I am a little terrified. My son adored Jay Z, the one Kian who works in the record business. Now all my sons and Luke, my eldest, Jay Z was their Bob Dylan, you know. Right. It, quite rightly, because of his flow, his lyric his lyrics and as is, is proven, he is he is the man. And he's he's charming. He says but he says the obvious thing that artists will say when confronted with later. Look, man, can't I just play all my songs and go? Because <laughs> Jay Z is well on the way to becoming a billionaire, and, and, and yeah. you know, being in being in TV centre, and I don't think he has a clue who else is on the show. And I try to explain to him that everybody performs their songs in turn, and while he is a multi-millionaire and the man in hip hop, that that actually he's going to enjoy this experience. Of course, I've got no proof of this. Of taking it in turns uh, and he looks pretty unconvinced and I still remember he's sitting there in a typical BBC dressing room with a single coat hanger <laughs> always provided for artists who are contemplating ending it all and nothing else <laughs> uh, and, um, 
and I and I'm down. I am kneeling down, taking the knee, as they now call it, although on both knees, explaining to Jay Z, who is sitting on his chair, how this is going to work with some considerable enthusiasm, as as you would hope. But realizing I'm, you know, later something as a, I think artists would say, you kind of have to experience. You yeah, can't yeah. Really explain it. And I, between me and Damien and whatever else was said, Jay, so eventually he walks on, on the floor. And there was always a great thing with later of the sense of people arriving because everybody rehearses and camera rehearses in isolation. So you have no mm-hmm. sense of the whole wedding cake until that moment. We let the audience in and all the bands come on the floor. And that's when the magic happens because suddenly you have a festival in front of you and all the people and Jay-Z goes in and suddenly realized essentially he's standing probably about 25 feet across from Dave Grohl and you know on his right is Nora Jones and on his left is Sting and and I can't remember which of them started the show but clearly I think Jay-Z started but clearly if you've got the Foo Fighters in full effect coming up hard on your on your on, on your rear end flashing their lights and saying, move over, will you? Or vice versa. One of the aspects of later that made people really deliver and play well was competition. Absolutely. You know, yeah, it, follow that. Follow the In, in like, the blues, God. they called it the cutting contest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and anyway, to, the final thing was so, the record company every time Jay-Z played anywhere, they obviously had to shower him with gifts and some some fragment of the rider that would be left behind. So I said I'd show an object. So this is, if you're down with hip hop, which clearly you both are. Oh, go on. <laughs> Remind me. A, this is a. This is what. This is. This is how we roll. Uh, it was a bottle of. Was that Cristal? It is one of those. Yes. This is Armand de Brignac, Brut Rosé. And it's probably worth your house. It's probably worth the house. And these were left behind. And Damien very kindly gave this to me for my trouble. <laughs> and uh, I probably should have drunk it by now. It's probably, I don't, I don't know how long it's supposed to last. No, it's, it's better to have the story. Oh. Yes. Leave it to your children and they'll well, be the best, happy. The we have a mug. My mug has Sergeant Pepper, but there's a mug with Kian who manages to get on the floor at the end of the show and snuggle up to his hero, Jay-Z, and there's Jay and uh, Kian. Oh, and right. Kian is probably oh, wonderful. 18 or 19, and uh, this is one of the family's proudest proudest trophies. Oh, I bet it is. I'm sorry I can't show it to you. No, don't worry, Mark. Listen, it's been fantastic talking to you and uh, and hearing that story of that, of that journey. Let's call it a journey. <laughs> it is a journey. Uh, officially uh, a journey. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry you won't get to don your green wellies this year. Uh, oh, well, oh, well I, I guess, you know, after 97 and 98, I mean, and 2005 and some of the other years, it'll be quite nice to be a bit more in control and slightly less scared that the headliners aren't going to let this film in, film them or we're going to sink in the mud or, you know, yeah, we, can, yeah. we can reflect back on those things without quite the sort of usual degree of tension and right, right. fear that frankly gets us through every Glastonbury. <laughs> <laughs> you make it sound so attractive. <laughs> well, we all want to go. <laughs> well, it's like anything, isn't it? You know, before you take the jump, it's, you need to be a bit scared and intimidated. And when oh, you yeah. read it over the end, some of the best nights of my life have been very late on Sunday night. At the end of Glastonbury, either round the fire or back at the Me hotel. Me too, entirely. With, I did 15 years on the run. Yeah. yeah, with the team celebrating that, you know, what we've done over the weekend and all the hours we broadcast, the good times, the bad times. And especially one of the things that's lovely about in television is the sense of collaboration with the team. And that's the thing I'm going to probably miss the most, actually, yeah, leaving the BBC. Man. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. The lovely sure. people I've worked with over the years. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, yeah. Those shows, Fantastic. you get a real sense of achievement and, and, and friendship. Well, look, we'll look forward to seeing you uh, on the other side. On when the other side. When well, this bloody war side. is over, when, uh, you know, when there's bluebirds over the White Cliffs of Dover. 
the well, lights now we know on. why we have these huge record collections, right? Absolutely. This yeah. is what it's for. We were you all prepared. Just, you can just, we can spend hours playing that record we haven't played since 1984. That's what, I, that's what I've yeah. been doing. That's what I've been doing. Fantastic. Mark, lovely to talk to you. Thanks so much. All the very best. Brilliant. And, uh, See you. Bye.